even introduce myself to you, but my name's Cassandra Sweeney. I teach English at the Eastern Campus here at Tri-C, and I am also part of the Stand for Racial Justice uh, Committee and our Sustainability Division. So we are very excited to have this opportunity to chat with you today and hear more about uh, your experiences. Um, the title of the session today is Building Sustainable Communities, Advocacy Strategies for Women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ plus populations. Um, and we are speaking with Stacey McCormick and Dondra Willis. And I'm going to give a little bit of a background on both of you for our audience today and then head into some questions that we had uh, submitted that, that I believe you've had a chance to, to check out. So Stacey McCormick is a Mississippi raised black feminist scholar and writer. She is an associate professor of English, yay, comparative race and ethnic studies and women and gender studies at Texas Christian University. Her work takes up a number of subjects such as representations of the body, land, sexuality, and the ongoing resonance of slavery in contemporary black writing and performance. She is the author of Staging Black Fugitivity and co-editor of the special issue of College Literature, Toni Morrison and Ad Adaptation. Currently, she's developing a manuscript on Black critical engagement with gynecological and obstetric medicine. In tandem with this work, she was awarded a 2021-2022 Mellon ACLS Scholars and Society Fellowship, where she served as a scholar in residence with the AFIA Center, a reproductive justice organization in Dallas, Texas. Welcome. Deandra Willis is a trained full spectrum doula and childbirth educator with the AFIA Center, offering a positive voice for her community, advocating for social justice and health equity for all. Deandra is a blessing to everyone she meets. Her path as a support provider in birthing, um, sorry, began long before she even knew what the word doula meant. And her desire to become a childbirth educator and doula began after years of supporting friends and family. As a full spectrum doula, she primarily provides important emotional, physical, and spiritual preparation for birth. Most importantly, she embraces each birthing person's birth vision while holding sacred space for them during their journey. Jandra believes birth is a rite of passage and counts it a privilege to be chosen to support a birthing person. Welcome again. Thank you. Um, is there anything you want to add to those bios before we delve into some questions this morning? Sure. I was just going to make sure the format, because I didn't know if you wanted us to go ahead and share our prepared remarks or if uh, before the questions or which order you'd like to go. Yes, that would be fantastic. I apologize for misrepresenting <laughs> the order of things. No, it's okay. It's okay. So we do have um, a slide to share and Deandra and I are going to be kind of going back and forth um, with each other. We, we are a tag team <laughs> um, around here in Texas. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully everyone can see um if i can return back let me see i had initially uh, what had it on the first slide and then it went away so now now we're in business okay um so uh deandra and i are going to be talking about what it means to kind of move from theory to practice um thinking about community building and advocacy for reproductive justice um we are a part of a beautiful team of folks at the AFIA Center. And I'm going to let Deandra kind of tell you all about the AFIA Center here in um, Texas. Good morning, everyone. Well, maybe afternoon. Um, so, again, I'm Deandra Willis. I'm with the AFIA Center. Excuse my cold. I'm getting over a little sickness. So, um, so I'm with the AFIA Center here in Dallas. We are the only Black woman founded and directed reproductive justice organization here in North Texas. Um, we were started and launched uh, to address the HIV epidemic 
among the black women and girls in Texas. Um, that is the start and the base of our work, but we also learned that our work had to extend beyond our HIV programming to include the services for our, um, full reproductive freedom. Um, we understood that a lot of time people who um, live with HIV, um, their diagnosis came from the different things that they lack access in. Um, so those are some, that is part of where our programs are. Our work is surrounded by the access that is needed and it also help address the HIV epidemic. Some of our programs that we have are designed to ensure that black women have the full right to choose if, when, and how they decide to parent. Um, some of the services are the full spectrum doula services that Dr. Stacy just mentioned. Um, we are proud to say that in the next few weeks, we will be doing our grand opening for our birth and wellness um, center in Dallas. Um, so super, super, super excited about that. Um, we also have our HIV advocacy and education, um, our peer support group, um, our mutual aid and our uh, mutual aid support. We also have a, a organizing and policy team that do a lot of our work um, on the federal level or national level for us. So we're all one big running full oil machine and super excited to do the work. It can be hard sometimes, but it's, it's well worth it. Um, and if you wanted to know more about the Afia Center, you can scan the QR link here and it'll give you more information It give you ways to donate. Um, we cannot uh, not address the fact that we are ran by donation. We are nonprofit. So donations are very, very vital for the work that we do and for us to sustain the work that we do. Yes, yes. So um, hopefully you all were able to catch that QR code and we can, we're happy to send it to us. Uh, you all afterward um, as well. Um, I also wanted to go ahead and sh share our members of our team. So Deandra and, and I are two representatives of a much broader and beautiful team of researchers and um, birth workers uh, and, and just all around wonderful people. So I wanna lift them up. Allison Tomlinson, Helen Zimba, Helen Zimba Kiana Arnold, Deandra, myself, and our executive director, Marsha Jones, all comprise the uh, Livable Black Futures Collective. So uh, as a way to get grounded before Deandra and I go into our own conversations, I did want to lift up and ground this uh, work in um, a kind of framework for reproductive justice. Um, I know that uh, people move between the terms like reproductive, reproductive rights, social justice. Um, and so those terms can mean different things in different contexts. And so reproductive justice is kind of the merger of the two, reproductive rights and social justice. Thinking about what it means to attend to the whole person, the whole community, well before um, they even become pregnant that reproductive justice is so much and so many things. And um, we ground our work in people and thinkers like Audre Lorde, who tells us that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives. Um, and our executive director, Marsha Jones, is very committed to that and has grounded this work in HIV AIDS as a reproductive justice issue. Um, and, and has moved this conversation forward. We're also really excited because Loretta Ross has recently been awarded um, a MacArthur Genius Grant. And she is one of the original founding um, members who coined the term reproductive justice. And just so we can have a shared understanding as well as lift her up in this conversation, we're gonna play this quick two minute video from her MacArthur Genius um, profile. When it comes to reproductive justice, if you start with the pregnancy, you're starting at the wrong place. You have to start with what's going on in the person's life before they're pregnant. My name is Loretta Ross, and I'm a reproductive justice and human rights activist. I was one of 12 black women who helped create the term reproductive justice when we spliced together reproductive rights and social justice because there were social justice issues prevalent in a pregnant person's life long before they even knew they were pregnant. 
because if they had housing insecurity or fear of losing their jobs or fear of violence in their lives, that would determine whether they would keep an unplanned pregnancy or not. Now, in short, reproductive justice has three basic principles. Every human being has the right to not have a child and use birth control or abortion or abstinence if that works for them. And we have to fight for the right to have the children that we want to have. And that's the second tenet. And it spawned a whole movement called birth justice, which is to control the conditions under which we have children. And then the third tenet is once the baby is born, we fight for the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments. Now, 10 years after 1994, the LGBT movement added a fourth principle about bodily autonomy, gender identity, and sexual pleasure. I'm not surprised that reproductive justice emerged out of Black women's reproductive experiences, because when we were kidnapped from Africa and bought here to breed as a wealth building strategy for capitalism, then our children were prized. But that same womb product became problematized and criminalized after slavery. I'm really invested in people seeing their entire world through the human rights framework. It doesn't matter what economic or social system you live under, because if it protects your human rights, that's the system you need to work to build. If it violates your human rights, that's the system you work to deconstruct. Okay, so I encourage everyone to go and learn more about Loretta Ross and the tremendous work she has done. And also our executive director, Marsha Jones, uh, one of uh, someone I feel everyone should know in the world because she has just been so instrumental in raising up these issues and creating support here in Texas at a place where these issues are highly contentious. Um, so moving to our kind of remarks, I'm gonna go ahead and situate my own work for you all, and then um, we'll go to uh, Deandra. And so um, first I want to just make sure to do um, a land acknowledgement um, as a kind of centering of decolonial um, approaches and solidarity with you all there in Ohio. Um, I speak to you from the campus of TCU, Texas Christian University on the unceded territory of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. I also honor the enslaved ancestors whose bodies were stolen for profit and exploited here in Texas, as well as throughout um, the Confederate uh, South. I also recognize the Erie people who inhabited the lands of Cuyahoga County. And I recently learned that Cuyahoga means Crooked River, um, named as such by the native peoples inhabiting the land. And so I think about rivers and movements and solidarities and how water kind of flows toward its destination. Often it's a powerful force and how many of us human beings can kind of uh, think and be like water, right? Going toward our destination because water doesn't kind of go off its course. It, it stays its course till it gets to its destination. I'm also thinking about the crooked rooms um, that Melissa Harris Perry discusses in her book, Sister Citizen, um, as a black as black women's attempts to confront racial and gender stereotypes. Um, she says that it's very hard to stand up in a crooked room. And I think that that um, message kind of goes and reverberates across communities because so many of us are kind of born into the society that is in position to support us. So we're, we're all trying to stand up in this crooked room um, and see ourselves. So thinking about you all's crooked river and these crooked rooms was very evocative for me. Um, and so I, I do hope that we can kind of think about what it means to stand up in these crooked rooms together. Um, I wanna talk about my work as an advocate and what it means to me because I'm an academic and I come to this space kind of from 
this dual place because as a black woman, a lot of this is I'm implicated in and I've had my own traumatic birth experiences that inform how I approach this work. Um, but one of the biggest things that I wanted to do when I came into this work was to disrupt the narrative that was pervading the conversation around the Black maternal mortality crisis. I saw such so much narratives that were um, about mother blame, um, this process of blaming victims for poor health outcomes. These articles would encourage women to lose weight, to stop smoking, to go to the doctor early and often, nothing really speaking to the fact that weight has not been established as a contributor to the maternal mortality crisis and neither has smoking. Um, and I was neither a smoker nor um, in a kind of position where they would deem me kind of at a, you know, um, unhealthy weight or however the medical institution names that. But I almost died in the hospital while giving birth. I came from a background where I went to the doctors early and often, but I almost died. And so it's also not speaking to issues of health care inequality and access because, you know, this idea that people can afford to go to the doctor early and often or that they have access to insurance is also something that puts the onus on the victim and not on the society um, that is, you know, should be committed to supporting that. Um, and there was certainly no mention of birthing people, um, a term that we use for all of those who have the capacity to give birth, including gender non-binary and gender expansive people. At the AFIA Center, we use the term womb holders. This is a term raised up by um, a queer health advocate and documentarian in community with us, Melissa Muganzo Murphy, who also uses that term to name people who have um, wombs, but are not necessarily reflective of kind of the traditional category of woman. Um, and they're still implicated in this conversation. And there's certainly been very little mention of those who are incarcerated. So even though, you know, um, I'm implicated in this work myself, I work from a place of solidarity knowing that none of us are free until all of us are free. And I also, in my work, I practice research justice, which is focusing on underserved areas, um, particularly um, those Black people who are from LGBTQ plus communities, those who are disabled, those who encounter weight stigma, those who are incarcerated, um, and, and people who essentially are what T.N. Sinor Campbell calls intersectionally invisible in reproductive justice work. So there are so many people who come to these spaces and are implicated in these conversations, but they fall out of the realm of public consciousness because they don't fit kind of the stereotypical or, or um, traditional understanding of people who are um, in these kind of precarious positions. Um, they inhabit mul multiple identities um, and multiple positionalities. Um, and so body, bodily autonomy and conversations about that have to begin here if we are to have true reproductive freedom. And when I say reproductive research justice or thinking about that, it's, I'm thinking about the strategic framework that um, seeks to achieve self-determination for marginalized communities. It centralizes communities and community voices and leadership in an effort to facilitate genuine lasting social change. And that was something that was so key to me because coming from academia, so much of our research is framed as kind of a self-serving, um, you know, advancement. So usually when you embark on a research project is to achieve promotion or it's to do something that is going to affect you and impact you. But I've often kind of felt like that wasn't enough for me. What about the communities that are impacted and need to be also lifted up and benefited from the work I do? And so in many ways, the AFIA Center gave me the possibility to actually move my theory to action. It gave me the chance to put into work the things that matter to me and the communities that matter to me. It gave me a chance to be in community with them. 
And so we created this livable Black future space as a way to, and we co-created that. That was so important. We co-created that. Um, Deandra, I, I can't even thank enough for her wisdom and insight in how in helping me shape this project because I went into it as an academic and I, I kind of, you know, had to reorient myself and, and, and do something different. And I think that was so beneficial to me. Um, and I often, I say this all the time, she's probably going to get tired of me hearing it, but Deandra's a doula, but I feel like she doula me as a researcher through this project. So, um, and I, I really, really can't say enough about how important that was because other researchers could say, okay, well, I'm the expert in the room and I'm going to go in here and do this my way. And it's important that we, you know, modify our thoughts around that. And so I'm going to kind of wrap up my remarks with talking about how storytelling as a form of advocacy has worked uh, for us at the AFIA Center, and Deandra is going to elaborate on that. But most chiefly, storytelling has been a way to let those who are often left out of the discourse a chance to, um, in a place to give a form of expression um, to their experiences without shame or stigma. There's so much shame and stigma that is prevalent around just sexual and reproductive health, period. But when it comes to, say, someone who is LGBTQ um, or from other communities where it's like just not talked about, there's so much silence. And so our goal was to break the silence. And I think for me, that's been the biggest impact of the advocacy work we've done is really breaking the silence around a lot of these conversations so that people do feel comfortable coming forward because you really can't change something you don't name and i don't know that as a society we've gotten into good practice having conversations and naming the problems that we want to address our participants have been wide ranging and they've all been astute teachers of us some of them have recently given birth some of them were um, long, you know, standing members of the community. We had a transgenerational group. Um, and we also had people who were formerly incarcerated, people who were LGBTQ. So we had uh, lesbian partners, as well as folks who were on the gender non-binary, um, you know, in that category. Um, and, and all of us talking together about how we can support and make space for each other. It was a beautiful experience that we've continued to carry on. And so that has really given me the space to offer um, and bridge theory with practice. And so I um, timed myself, so you might've heard me stop. But that is everything that um, I have to say. I just feel like if we don't fully immerse ourselves in practice, um, we aren't going to get the results that we hope to as we work from the academy and beyond the academy's walls. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Deandra. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Stacy, for that. And as always, um, I thank you for even inviting me to um, speak with you today uh, on this beautiful platform. Uh, <clears throat> As you, as you know, Dr. Stacy uh, does her work from an academia um, perspective, and it's been an honor to work with her because I do mine from community. <laughs> um, one thing that brought me in as a full spectrum doula, and then we'll talk about like the advocacy and birth justice, but one thing that brought me in um, as a doula, wanted me to just even be a doula or even look into it was I don't have a traumatic birth story, but I've witnessed, I've served, I've been a part of so many people that has had traumatic birth stories and just me having my first baby. And then shortly after that, um, having my second, you know, pregnant with my second baby, I quickly got, you know, afraid to even have that baby because I'm thinking that learning about maternal mortality is not about a status or class or anything. It was strictly or racism and and I was like a 100% chance of not being able to be there for my first baby. Um, so I had to figure out like, what could I do to be a part of the change in this? And so that's how I became, that's how I got into birth work. Um, I've always had a love 
and a passion to serve women and people through their, their birthing years. And so doula just put a name to what I had already been doing as a young child. Um, so I got trained with um, a national um, doula association and I still felt like that wasn't enough for me. Um, I didn't feel like I, I got the tools that I needed, but I still didn't feel like that was what my community needed. And so I went again and got certified through another um, another so doula association. And that was all that I needed. I needed the practical. I needed like the community part. And so I take that and, and, and created that partnership with Dr. Stacy to look at that. You have an academia, you have a national platform, you have um, strategic um, agendas that you're coming in for. But when you come into the community, you have to be really focused and open and, you know, willing to just like figure out what is it that the community need. So as my work as a, a advocate for birth justice, um, we look at birth justice as um, giving people the power and the education that they need as a womb holder. So when you look up birth justice, you may see um, empowering women to either birth or not birth, have the birth in, um, of their choice, how they want to birth, if they want to be parents. But with the work that we do at the Field Center, we look at birth being if you decide to terminate, if you don't decide to terminate. We look at parents being not just a mother and a father, but two people that decide they want a parent. So we look at people that have womb experiences, but not identify with how they were, you know, born or, so you can identify however you want, but you will have, you know, you have a womb experience. So we support people, we support folks exactly where they are. With birth justice, I go in as the birth justice coordinator. My advocacy may look like partnering with like, um, Researchers like Dr. Stacy, our local hospitals, figuring out where those gaps are, really doing a lot of community um, groups to figure out like what is, what is it that you need that I can take back to connect those dots. I'm, I just call myself the gap filler. <laughs> we fill a gap. We figure out like where the gap is, what the issue is, and I do my work in like trying to fill that gap. And so part of today, I gap filler is getting information out there on like what is it that we need is getting people to understand getting you all to understand what is it that we need how can you advocate better in the work that you're doing ways that i've worked to um build sustainable community is as a full spectrum doula um so you have like a birthing doula you have a postpartum doula birthing doula is there for the birth you know pre you know during the pregnancy during the birth and then you have postpartum who's strictly there for birth, uh for postpartum well as a full spectrum doula i'm there for the full spectrum of the reproductive scale so that could be miscarriage abortion um the pregnancy end of life infertility like all of that so it's funny when dr stacy say that i do her through the project because i do the people through life <laughs> in a <laughs> different way like i don't ever notice and so that's part of my uh, my advocacy or ways that I help build sustainable communities because sometimes they can look like um, voter engagement education. Sometimes they can look like parenting classes or community building projects that we know will help sustain the community because a lot of times we don't see ourselves outside of our community. And we don't understand that, you know, we uh, are struggling. We don't understand that we lack access like a lot of people. So if that one person understands that and take that out into the community to say, hey, y'all, these are all our options here. I know this is what was presented, but this is the options that you have. Um, so that's part of like how I help with that. Um, I work a lot with our voter engagement um, program. Um, so learning just the different um um, things that we need to like become informed voters. Uh, right now, we are working a campaign that that a reproductive justice reproductive justice voter, and um, we're doing a campaign on that to get more people to vote along the lines that support their reproductive justice needs versus as a Democrat or Republican or however. It's more so what who's the candidate that's going to support your reproductive your reproductive justice needs and health needs. And we vote along those lines because we know that will help sustain our community. We know that um, that that supporting women or womb holders that that will help sustain our communities because 
we're the ones that hold up the community. We're the ones that take care of the, you know, the children, the household. And so if you are down, then everybody is down, you know? So we understand that that's a very important role. Um, at the Fifth Center, we also have our mutual aid um, program where we're able to support people where they are. That mutual aid can look like free doula support. That mutual aid can look like paying for midwives. Um, that that's where the lines of our birth and wellness center is um create that's why it was created we wanted to do just the birth center but we realized the community that we need need us more than just for a birth center um the people that we serve birthing outside of a hospital is still a luxury they don't have the means to birth outside of a hospital they don't even have adequate housing you know so to think about a home birth when you don't have a home it's not possible. So just to be able to have a birth and wellness center where you may be able to come labor here and then we go to the hospital. You have a place to do your postpartum here and then you go maybe go labor, you know, have the baby at the hospital. Um, being able to provide classes, you know, some people <clears throat> may think they have a lot of kids, but they never had parents in classes, you know, so those things are important for some people. It's like, oh, that it doesn't matter. They don't need it, but you'll be surprised. A lot of people never had it, and it changed the tra trajectory of their life and the way that they parent with kid number five versus kid number one. You know, and it just makes them a better parent all the way around. And then you know, life happens. So I have three children. They five, three, and two. <laughs> Number one was a different parent. Number three is a totally different way that I have to parent. So I understand, you know, understand that. And I take my, I use my lived experiences everywhere I go because it is needed. It, it shows solidarity with people to understand that they're not alone in what they're doing. So we use those lived experience all the time. So at our birth and wellness center, we always talk about um, our capital fund and ways to donate to a field center because People that are served there are being served for free. We understand that they already lack access. They under, they lack in health insurance, food. They're in a food desert, um, inadequate housing. So what we try to do is, you know, be there for them, and it's and it's free of service. But it's just because it's free of service doesn't mean that it's the worst service. It's still top notch, you know, top notch service. So part of our funding goes to community midwives that can come in and provide those services. Part of the funding that we get are, uh, goes to the community doulas that we have aboard that are, that are a part of us to be able to give those services out free because they're still they're still needed. Um, also with our mutual aid fund, it may be um, uh, rental assistance. I'm sorry, I couldn't think rental assistance. Um, you know, things to pay your bills. Uh, we also have a large population of women that live with HIV. And because of lack of Medicaid expansion, a lot of the medications that they have, they can't get, they can't afford because you're talking two and three thousand dollars, you know. And so part of our funding goes to um, helping people get their HIV medication, getting in treatment, staying in treatment. That's a big thing, too. Um, just working towards decriminalizing the HIV criminalization that we have. Um, just even with the decision to overturn Roe, a lot of people were wondering, like, why are y'all not only talking about abortion? And we would tell them, like, it's, you know, our work is bigger than abortion. It's way bigger than abortion because now you think about a woman living with HIV going to get an abortion, and now they're knowing, like, okay, she's living with HIV, but she's having unprotective sex. Our criminalization for HIV is almost 10 to 10 years to life just to know you have exposed someone, you know, so we have to look at ways that the sustainability plan is protecting the people that we serve in our community. So our work is very, very broad, <laughs> but we understand that it's reproductive justice all the way around. And, and in birth justice, it's me just trying to fill those gaps and figure it out and coming in a harm reductionist way for people to understand that you don't have to parent if you don't want to. If you have 25 kids and number 26 is not who you, you know, is not at that time what's good for your life, then we help you in ways to make sure that you can make the options and the choices that you need. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think if I have ad advocated on uh, behalf of others. Yes, I and I'm gonna let you keep going with the Bill of Rights. <laughs> okay, and this is one. This is this is perfect. So ways that we advocate for others. Uh, one example is our um, Liberal Black Futures um, research group that we do. I don't even call it research. I just like to call it like a, I don't know, a community circle. I yes, I, I like that. I think <laughs> that's more accurate. Yeah. So because it was so intertransgenerational, our conversation on every session that we have had, we have come up with a Black Womb Holders Bill of Rights. And it was inspired by NAABB Black Birthing Bill of Rights. So you can, I think you can click that link or we can send it out and you can learn about it. But we took their uh, Bill of Rights and we brought it into our space. And at that time, it was people in the space that did, still did not feel that they seen themselves in those Bill of Rights. And so a lot of times our, our conversations were very organic and what the people were needing at that time. So some of the things that, you know, people were saying was they have the right to choose not to have children at any point in their lives. Um, I can say in the black culture, and I, I think it may be across the board. If a woman do not have children or choose not to have a child, they, their worth is low. Like they're not worth anything or they don't mean like, you're not a woman until you have that child. Um, and it was a few women that actively look for ways to make sure they don't have children. And a lot of um, medical providers were, no, it was just there. It was, it was according to how they feel as a medical provider versus what that client at that time was telling them. Um, I have a limited right to an abortion at any gestational point in the pregnancy. I have the right to a judgment-free experience with healthcare providers and judgment-free conversation about sexual and reproductive health in my community. I have the right to a safe and compassionate gynecological healthcare experience. I have the right to receive information about all of the options available to me as it relates to my sexual and reproductive health. Um, that speaks a lot on how um, our full spectrum doula collective how we work. That's one thing we tell doulas that, that are part of our collective, that we are here to push the agenda in the narrative of the person we're serving, not our own. And we have to go in and listen to them. And that that's what the advocacy piece is a lot of times missing is advocates do not listen to the people that they're serving and helping, and you're helping them and guiding them and creating what they need for themselves, the plan for themselves. Not me. I hardly ever, and even if I don't agree with what that person that I'm serving is doing, I give them all of the options. And as long as the options are safe and in the way that they need to be safe, then I go along with it. When I come home, I shower and it's not on me. <laughs> uh, I have the right to make the best choice for me at any age. I have the right to care that I have the right to care that is not informed by ableism or race-based medicine. I have the right to gynecological care that is not influential by homophobia, transphobia, or any normative perspective that does not consider my identity. Um, that was a big one also that we learned in our space um, that a lot of times uh, people of trans experience are just disrespected in the worst regard because it's always the medical provider I, um, identifying them for what they see versus what they have listed they are identified as. And we know that sometimes that transformation can be over years. And because of lack of access, lack of funds, it may be a few years, but that doesn't matter if you know, we have to see the people before the trees. That that's just like kind of like my theory practice in life. I have to see the people before the trees. And so if I have uh paperwork or information that I'm collecting on someone, it is my right, it is all of our right and responsibility to go by what they have presented us, not by what we see. If that's what they have identified, we have to go by that. And it it, it is it is highly disrespectful when we don't. I have the right to be called by my chosen name and not by my given name during medical appointments. I have the right for my son to receive a, a thorough education on his sexual reproductive health and rights. 
I have the right to support shame-free and anti-sexist community conversation about my sexual and reproductive health. And so I list grow and grow and grow and grow for each session that we have because again, it, it, it will change and it will grow because everyone in this space wants to be able to see themselves in their Bill of Rights. And so we take these Bill of Rights and especially with our um, our doula clients and we present these, you know, to them. And if you do not see yourself in here, you're able to add. We use these to um, as a tool of education when folks are going to the doctor to be able to advocate for, for themselves because you do have the right. And we tell them like, hey, your provider really works for you. So if you need to fire your provider in the middle of your pregnancy or your care, that's fine. And you find you another one. It, you don't have to stay with them. You're not stuck with them. Yes. You know, you're not stuck with them. Yes. And so we're just going to to end on some tips to kind of go into this conversation about advocacy. Um, and we just want to go ahead and share like our work is very specific and within a specific geographical context. And we just want to affirm that advocacy looks so different depending on the communities that you are advocating for. And so you need to let that guide your practice. Um, you want to speak with and not for the communities you represent, right? You're not the representative of that community. You are a partner with them. Meet your community members where they are. Not everyone is going to be at the same awareness level as uh, you. Understand their perspectives and perform a risk assessment about what they're willing to do to achieve their goals. Deandra shared with me that that's a key point about what they do before they go into communities. Because you can say, I want to support abolition, right? But not everyone is ready to confront the police or not everyone is ready to do the kinds of things that you might be ready to do. So you want to center the safety of the communities you advocate for. Also, co-create outcomes with your community. Let them take the lead. Um, we go by a philosophy of leadership of the most impacted and that decenters power and gives everyone a voice in the conversation. And also vet the resources you share before presenting them to your communities, because, you know, one of the things that we find, especially here in Texas, is things like birth crisis centers that are actually posing as, you know, trying to uh, get people not to have abortions or to dissuade them in that way. It's not really a supportive space. Um, that is just a lot like in, um, especially in LGBTQ, um, community is um, thinking about conversion therapy. And I was even really happy to see that in Ohio, many state, uh, many cities, including Cleveland, have outlawed conversion therapy, any subtle um, practice of that. Um, also be versatile, talk with different constituencies and be prepared to present your ideas in different ways for different audiences. So I'm an academic. I'll sometimes go to a nursing class and talk and I need to be able to talk to them and, you know, explain some of the things that I would like to advocate for. But when I go toward another audience, you know, the things I say in one audience won't resonate for everyone. Um, so you have to be mindful of that and also be committed to ending white supremacy culture in your practice. I have a link to that. We have a link to that for but um, I'm happy to talk more about, you know, some of these principles or share that link for people who are interested in what it means to dismantle white supremacy. And so that is our uh, talk. And I can stop sharing my screen at this point so that we can go to um, Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was jotting down things. So if you saw me reaching for a pen, <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, um, some good new terminology for all of us to consider and some other things to, to check out. Um, I'm going to get us started today and hopefully I know um, Magda is keeping her eye on the chat and so am I. Um, so our first question is, what resources are available and advertised in order for the individuals of LGBTQ plus to feel recognized and validated when they feel violated now that social issues surrounding Roe v. Wade have erupted into chaos? And there's emphasis on not just the available resources, 
but those that are advertised. So we were looking at that question in advertise. Um, I just, I, I felt many ways about that. So advertise, I think a lot of times for in Texas, a lot of the advocacy, I mean, a lot of the advertise is around um, HIV um, education um, with PrEP, um, with National HIV um, Alliance. But that's not like the surface of LGBTQ. So I always think about how it's different for everyone. And... I couldn't really answer the advertising because a lot of it is, I didn't want to stigmatize that with HIV. Um, but I always just say that just do the research for your community or you know, for your community, because what I can say is in Texas may not be for you. And so just doing that research and it's not, maybe a lot of times you're not going to be advertised on TV, but just the, non, the um, grassroots organization are going to be your best bet for the information that you need, for the advocacy that you need, because they're the ones that are truly on the ground doing the work. Um, a lot of the national uh, national organizations are not doing the deep, deep work, the, the street work, like I say. They don't, they're not doing that. And so getting to know and creating partnerships, which are um, grassroots organization, is where your advocacy is going to be at. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, one of the things that to me, I would suggest too is kind of tapping into kind of those unexpected communities like social justice organizations where you might be able to vet resources because usually those organizations are composed of multiple people of different backgrounds and different, um, you know, uh, places they're coming into this work from, and they might have the best read on the resources as opposed to um, something that someone can tell you that they haven't necessarily experienced themselves. Um, Cause I was looking at the LGBT community center that is in Cleveland. And while the website is um, really, you know, it seems really great. And there is some stuff about birthing on the website because if we've never experienced those, we can't necessarily say, yeah, that's the place. Right. But I would say really lean into the concept of mutual aid that Deandra was raising up. And that mutual aid could look like crowdsourcing resources and vetting them among the communities so that you aren't just sending people blindly to something that they might actually experience harm. Great points. Um, and I, I like the emphasis on grassroots organizations, um, and also your point that you know regionally things are, are very different. Mm -hmm. So, great, great point. Now, um, one one of them is to um, the human rights campaign is like a national campaign for uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community for any harm for support group. It, it, but it's a national campaign, so I'm gonna say you find, you know, go there and maybe again figuring out because most grassroots organizations are part of national campaign mm -hmm. and be connected with what's in your community. Yes, and a lot of times with the national organizations, they have chapters, right? Local, yeah. more local chapters. So that that's a great place place to start for advocacy as a whole. Mm -hmm. We actually have a student question, it looks like in the chat from, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but I've got Sviatslav, and they are asking, can you talk about a difficult day or situation you faced in your advocacy? Um, I can start. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's always a difficult, not difficult, it's always a challenging day um, working in our local county hospitals. Um, coming up with a birth plan the whole nine months, you know, on what the desires are, what your options are, and this is the plan that we're going to do, you know, on, I call the um, game day. And the most challenging is working with the medical providers who just don't care about that birth plan, who don't, you know, who sees up that person, that birthing person as a number, as a tree. And mm -hmm. as a doula, um, 
I feel like I'm going in a, in a fight and I'm ready to fight going in because I know that I'm going to have to assert, you know, assert my aggressiveness with making sure that the person that I'm serving plan is um, fulfilled, is looked at, is considered, and it becomes challenging when we're not, we're never trying to end with a C-section if we don't have to, but mm -hmm. when it ends there, because the provider chose not to respect them or listen to them, it's always challenging for me. And it takes me almost a week to like recover from those births because I feel like a failure sometimes because that's my job. But I, I have to understand that it's the systemic racism that plays along in the white supremacy that, that undergirds the system, the hospital systems here. And I can't take it personal, but it's hard not to because you work so long and it's just, just the little bitty thing of if you would have just listened, if you would have considered it, we wouldn't have had to turn out like this. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, um, I've even thought about this with respect to my own work as a researcher. So Deandra, you remember this day, um, because so we had come off of, we had two separate, um, uh, groups that we did our livable black future storytelling project with in our first group um, they had a bit more kind of freedom they were um, you know much more kind of cohesive we were able to connect they had resources um, and then we shifted to our formerly incarcerated group and it was a totally different context so we initially met with them on Zoom and we were kind of going over things. We had about 15 people show up and they were seemed like they were ready to go. And then we started getting the questions about transportation and we got questions about other dynamics. We learned that many of them worked at night. So this assumption that we were making about like the time they would be available, some of them were like, I can't be there. So on our very first meeting, we went from when in the previous um, engagement, we would have 20, you know, or so people come. We had two the first <laughs> night. <laughs> and those two, one was a result that um, we got an Uber for them and the other person was able to get there. And all of those folks who we thought were going to come did not come. And then the two who showed up didn't really talk. Mm -hmm. so, we had, so we had a really interesting night that night and it was you know one of those moments for me where I was going in my head and thinking about what I could have done better to get more people in the space or even get them to talk and it was really you know and Edie Jones was there that day and uh, I didn't realize how much we needed her to be there because right. she talked about how it doesn't matter if only one or two people show up this work is important and we're going to keep going and it really kind of it, it showed me a few things like blind spots like yes we're going to have to shift our timing we're going to have to think about going to the virtual space we really wanted to do in person but for this particular community that didn't work we had to bring in people and thankfully the afia center has and employs people who have been formerly incarcerated so we brought them into the space because we realized that as you know folks who've never experienced incarceration there was a whole gap speaking of like filling gap there was a whole gap of knowledge and experience that we had that it was hard to bridge they had to figure out how to trust us we didn't know that many of them were on parole so that they were trying to fight to kind of make sure that how they were perceived in public was all good so that they don't go back so, you know, much less talking about what they experience behind bars. So there was a whole like, so that day I think I left and it was difficult. <laughs> and, and, but it taught me so much about, you know, the ways that we need to be um, conscious of the people we're trying to serve because we can have one view of what they need and how to get it to them, but they might have so many other complications mm -hmm. that we need to take into consideration. So thank you for that question. I think it, it also goes back to, you know, one of your last slides that you, the, the ability to pivot in situations mm -hmm. and adapt um, is important. And I think all, another point that you brought up before that, that ties in here is 
remembering to listen to you know the people and the community and what they need um, and and learning from that is is a key component of of advocacy thank you those are both great examples uh, we have another question um, from Juice McKenna, uh, who is also part of the Stand for Racial Justice Committee, and she says, Deandra, Deandra, I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> Here we go. I got it. Deandra, you mentioned that home birthing is still a luxury for folks, and I feel that natural drug free birthing is also a luxury for some folks. What difficulties do black womb holders face when trying to advocate for pain meds in hospitals? Um, they are not believed or trusted. So when they go in outside of birth, they are not believed that their pain level is what they're saying it is. And so they're not given any medication. However, inside of the um, birthing space, as soon as you come in at a half a centimeter, they want to give you an epidural. Um, and we know that starts the the train ride to cesarean section because it'll be failed to um, fail to um, birth, like fail to progress. That's what it is. Fail, failure to progress because you're not allowing your body to do what it do. You don't need to do because now we have started this intervention line. Um, so it's no the the biggest advocacy that we can give as doulas and what i do i say what i do as a doula is we labor at home um be, you know through the pregnancy some of our classes is on pain management positioning stretching um maybe um herbal medicine um essential oils that we can use for pain management um the first key to it is childbirth is is going to be pain so we have to really tell them it's like I don't know, you know, everything is being fantasized and romanticized that, you know, you're not going to feel any pain with childbirth, but that's a total lie. It's going to be pain there. And so when I start there, they have in their head and understand like, okay, it's going to be a pain. And so from there, we start our steps to like what pain management will look like, um, because there's not a lot of advocacy in the hospital, because if I'm telling them, oh, you don't need to start Epidore right now, you still have the doctors that that's their expertise and so you have my community expertise versus a doctor expertise you know we're here with it so they start to tend to believe and doubt themselves and what they can do and what their body can do and so they're starting to believe the doctor and so we're left in a position of getting the epidural to you know um just everything it's just so many different interventions that causes the c-section because we know the end game is to turn the beds do the c the, the cesarean so we can get more people in and it's a train ride <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it, it's more so let's labor at home labor at home if we can and, and because we know it's inadequate housing in our community that's part of why we have our birth center again is that if they can't labor at home, if they have children, if it's too many people in the house, they're able to come and labor at our birth center and you have a doula to be there and you have, you know, your family or your birthing, you know, community, your, your birthing team, who's going to be there with you? They're able to come along with us, with them. Fantastic benefit. I um, have some more student questions. Um, from Maria, what has reproductive justice accomplished up to now? Yeah. Do you want me to start that one? Yeah, you can start <laughs> Oh my goodness, where do I begin? I right. mean, reproductive justice has changed the game uh, when it comes to how we talk about people um, with respect to um, justice, reproduction, um, it has created um, networks. So um, I'm thinking about the, um, you know, RJ collectives that are um, national collectives where you have different um, groups who are able to connect across different states and collectively advocate for people, um, you know, more tangibly, you know, the fact that we talk about things like the black maternal mortality crisis um, and that it has riven, risen to the level of our consciousness is a result of reproductive justice discourse. The fact that we have so much um, expansive, you know, conversations on HIV AIDS, um, conversations about medication, conversations about access, 
that's a result of reproductive justice advocacy. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, even environmental justice, um, all types of ways that, you know, reproductive justice advocates have said, you know, we cannot um, sustain, you know, these kinds of societies that are built on systemic inequalities and they have gone in and worked across the spectrum. So the reason why you might not say see a tangible like, you know, outcome in, you know, large um, scale is because reproductive justice spreads its work out everywhere and it works collaboratively with people and it's not a centralized kind of leadership model where only, you know, people in the RJ space are doing this kind of work and that we own that work, that we work across and with community. So I give you during COVID and Deandra, I'd love for you to talk more about this because the AFIA Center stepped up in so many ways to support communities around resources, um, mutual aid funds, bail funds for people who were protesting for racial justice. We weren't just limiting the work, right, to um, talking about, okay, well, what are we doing for people in hospitals where COVID is, you know, an issue and they're going into birth because that was a part of it, but that wasn't the only part of the work. So, um, Deandra, I can let you speak more to that too. <laughs> so you're right. So that's, um, what started our mutual aid fund was, I think it was the black mama's bailout, um, because we really have. Um, people sitting in jail in Texas for $25 because they don't have $25 to bail out. Mm -hmm. And so what started our fund, mutual aid fund, was to go and sit at the jail to see, like, you know, this list of, you know, Black women, because we prioritize our work for Black women, Black identifying women. That's who we serve. We went to the jail and we was like, okay, what do we have here? And to see that it's thousands and thousands of women sitting in jail for less than a $500 bond, we were able to do that. But we also seen that once we start building them out, they were quickly returning because mm -hmm. it was lack of access. It was lack of food. It was lack of job because of you being able, you know, going to jail. Now you have this record. It was homelessness. It was, it was a lot of other things. And so... We started to see that uh, reproductive justice mean meeting the needs, meeting the people where they are. And so we were saying, okay, if we can bail you out, if we can get your Uber card to get to a safe place or like maybe your mother's or your other kids, and maybe getting you some groceries to feed your kids that are now at the house and they're, are there. If we get you, with you, giving you some clothes so now you, Monday you can go and do some interviews to get a job, it won't let you back in jail. You know, and so... Our mutual aid grew from there and then when COVID, when COVID came and then all of the different protests and things and then even with like the winter storm that happened, a lot of the community, the vulnerable communities were <clears throat> without access of heat and water and electricity for weeks because of that winter storm that was here almost two years ago. Um, <clears throat> it was because of our loud voices where we were holding community uh, constituents responsible, um, city officials responsible for communities that are on, like on TV, you're saying, so again, back to this media thing, on TV, you're saying you're helping these community. I was one of the ones that started that because I'm like, my grandmother is 86 years old. She's paralyzed and cannot move. And she's in a community where she has no heat. She can't go to a hotel. She can't go to a warming station. So what are you doing? You're lying. You're not providing for your community. You know, and so if it wasn't for our loud voices to help those people, then we became the mutual aid, like, okay, let's buy a generator and for this elderly person and like maybe pass it around as their lights come on. And so that work has gotten so large now. <laughs> um, now we, we do a lot more work like for HIV and people getting their medication because of um, we don't have Medicaid, um, Medicaid uh, expansion here. Um, so people are not able to get their, you know, their, their medication, um, with our abortion work, we seen that a lot of black women were not being served in hell, like other people that were getting abortion funding, um, uh, because of our lived experience. And we know we are the women that we serve at the Afia Center. We understood that going to get an abortion when, you know, SBA came, it wasn't as easy as go to, you know, Mexico or Oklahoma to go get an abortion and come back. No, we had, they had to deal with childcare. 
They couldn't afford to be off their job for three to five days. So if they went to go get an abortion, they were losing their job. So they had to pay somebody to do childcare. They needed groceries. They needed a way there. They needed a hotel when they get there. Like, so it became this whole thing of, okay, we have to help because yes, you have a national abortion fund that's paying for the procedure, but how are we going to get there to get the procedure? Where are we going to stay when we get the procedure? What are my kids going to do if, if I don't have a babysitter? And let's not talk about if they were in an abusive relationship. Now we have to get you there and get you back soon before your abuser find out that you're gone. Mm -hmm. So it's so many lived experiences that we have and that we understand that we have to help in this way. And so we did step up, like Dr. Stacey said, we stepped up without funding. We, we're still not fully funded with our mutual aid. Uh, we just do what we can to support our community because we are dedicated to our community. Thank you. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of accomplishments. I, I suspect <laughs> there are, are many, many more, and that was already impressive. Yes, okay. and I just want to lift up Loretta Ross again because having a MacArthur Genius um, recipient be a reproductive justice advocate is huge because I think a lot of people don't know about this work. Um, and raising up a key thinker, you know, it just brings so much awareness. So I would encourage you all to look her up and even see some of the work. Look at the work of Sister Song. Look at the work of the Afia Center. Look at the work of Sister Love. All of these different organizations that are born out of that reproductive justice um, kind of framework and brainchild, a uh, love child that that has been brought into the world. Thank you. I'm going to keep going with some student questions um, from Dinah. How can a person with HIV live with a baby? <laughs> Easy, stay on treatment. Um, they have so many. So the mother to child <clears throat> perinatal transmission is not as common as people think. Um, as long as you know the mom stays, the birthing person stays on treatment, like prep. Um, then it will reduce the chance of that transmission from mama to mommy to baby. Um, so when we serve our women, because we do have, so we do serve people with living with HIV with breastfeeding, um, that choose to breastfeed and choose to have a vaginal birth versus a cesarean section. And, um, that's what we tell them. Like, we just make sure they're on treatment. We help them to understand, like, it well. I'm not gonna say we make sure they're on treatment. We give them their options on like, if you're on treatment, this is what the outcome is. And if you're not on treatment, this is what the outcome is. And so we just support them on their treatment plan. Um, that could look like reminders. Sometimes they can look like maybe going to the doctor. Again, the transmission and exposure, um, the transmission exposure criminal charge is really big here in Texas. Um, we li we have a man that's sitting in jail because he spit at somebody and he has an exposure charge, a criminal exposure charge of like, I think 10 to 15 years that's okay. sitting in jail for spitting at someone. So we have to think about um, the women that are going into the hospital pregnant with HIV and what that um, exposure can look like. So they're scared. So a lot of times it's, us as doulas, and we have uh, with our HIV, uh, Miss Helen Zimba, she works a lot nationally with our HIV work, but she helped guide us on that. We're making, creating partnerships and relationships with the doctors that support HIV, our HIV people just locally, and just getting, you know, let, educating them on the things that they need and what it means to just be pregnant outside of your diagnosis. Just what it means to be pregnant. Uh, and what that looks like as a pregnant person birthing, a black person birthing in Texas, what that looked like on top of a diagnosis. So it's no science project to it. It's just, you know, they're on treatment and you will, you know, that, that transmission won't go to the baby. Wonderful. I'm from Olha for Deandra. And this is a question I was wondering too, but about how many people does your organization serve? Um, for as far as doula or just mutual aid. 
So I'm going to talk about both. Okay, I'll talk about both. So with our mutual aid, which can be like our abortion work, which we, that's no longer here anymore because of Roe. Um, but before Roe, we were serving with our abortion work, maybe about 100 women a week. Um, our mutual aid can range from the, the same thing because, so I'll say on a, on a normal day, you're think we're thinking about maybe 20 to 30 women, um, within a week. Um, but when a crisis happens, so when COVID happened, when, you know, weather and all that kind of things, you're looking at almost two to 300 people in a month, um, with, with that in, um, with our doulas. Because the work is so hard on us, we try not to take no more than about three or four uh, people that's due in the same month because most of the people that we serve is not just supporting doing pregnancy. It's supporting and, and part of being part of our program with mutual aid is that we are there for them 13 months outside after the service, not the 12, but 13. We, we did realize that. Yes, you know, we get through it in a year. Think about like for those that have mothers that have children, you know, once they make it to their first year birthday, you don't always feel relieved. It's like the next month after you can sit down and reflect on, okay, they alive, I'm alive, you know. <laughs> so we, we stay with people to, for, for 13 months outside of that service. So we don't overload ourselves, like caseload ourselves with so many people. Um, we are big on our resources so that if we can't, you know, we try to resource them out with vetted partnerships that if I can't help, you know, I know sister or I know organization that can help, um, with that. And then again, I'm, I'm never afraid to talk about funding. We can't do a million because we don't have the funding to, we would love to, because that means that's, you know, that's more opportunity for jobs. We have 10 volunteer doulas. We would love to bring all 10 on staff, but we only have three on staff, you know, so more funding, we get more people on staff to do more work, but yeah, we have to prioritize our mental health, you know, in, in the work that we do, because it can be very heavy, heavy. And again, we are the people we serve. So we have to take that in context when life is happening for us, we have to stop and listen to our bodies. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to my questions I had here and then and then switch back to the student questions because I think this is one that fits in uh, to some extent you're talking about you know self care and I think that connects to this idea of how we interact with family and friends who might have different beliefs so the question is how do I advocate for my beliefs with family and close friends who hold different feelings. Deandra, do you want to start or? Uh, I, to me, I, in mine is simple, harm reduction is, um, so just because I'm transparent, I am a, a very spiritual church girl. And so a lot of people will bring up um, my abortion beliefs um, mm. because that's just, you know, and I tell them one first, I am held accountable and responsible for what I do with my body. And if you think about the higher being of God, whoever, however you identify that higher being in your life, um, it's in a harm reductionist way. Um, it's loving them through whatever choice that they make. And in and, and it's sometimes loving them not to have that conversation with them if it becomes harmful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I was thinking about this too, because that's a really tough question. I mean, you know, um, I too am from a very kind of uh, religious context from growing up in the South and growing up in Mississippi. You know, so many of my relatives and people in my life are are very much committed to things that I'm I'm not nearly, you know, on board with. And so sometimes I have to like constantly like pick and choose how I'm going to engage and I have to really reinforce my boundaries. Um, one of the things that I will say, because I hear a lot of people like talk about, oh, Thanksgiving is coming up. You got to challenge your relatives. You got to do this, you know? And I think that, you know, on one hand, there is so much importance in challenging and calling out things when they 
when people say things in your life, because that is where it starts. Um, but I also think there's something to be said for like making sure you are not putting yourself in um, a kind of harm's way to feel like you have to be the, the warrior out there at the dinner table all the time, because that can be taxing on your mental health. And that can be taxing on your well being, especially if you are of that the community you're advocating for. So let's say you are queer and you're trying to help people understand, you know, why it's important to advocate and under and and you know treat everyone with respect. But when that person comes back at you, it's a personal, right? It it is mm-hmm. a it is a very deeply felt, you know, um, experience. So so really really thinking about that. But and I also want to kind of take this um, conversation and and put it on a broader uh, sphere because a lot of the critical work I always tell people you know I love that people are becoming more socially conscious in our society I love that people are wanting to read more and wanting to do more but social transformation is not self help it start it is is definitely something that is micro level but it's also macro, it's big picture. These are systems. And so you can persuade an individual and still that system can be maintained and upheld. Everybody in your family can come to your worldview and it still be systemic biases and things out there in the world. So sometimes you have to think strategically Mm -hmm. about how you wanna engage and if you think that your energies and your well-being is best served by going and advocating at that legislative level, going mm-hmm. into you know other spheres, then maybe consider that while you kind of engage with your family, because you know it's it is not you know it can't be solved through an individual change. Unfortunately, these are long-standing, well-run systems. Great, great point. Um, I'm going to go back to student questions and I see that Amy asked HIV treatment is important. Why don't local hospitals help them? Um, <laughs> I was going to say systemic racism. <laughs> I mean, because it's, it's no other way. Like data has proven, like, if you think about the HIV AIDS epidemic back you know, when it like first started, look at the numbers trending from like, even just like 10 year by 10 year, you know, you'll see it's not a different, like it's not decent and it's ascending and it's, it's a shame that it's ascending because the medicine has involved, evolved. Um, mm-hmm. We've gotten more money, but not money in those communities that need it the most. Um, but if they don't ever acknowledge the lack of access is going to keep on ascending um with it because we so we have a group called lol live out loud and that gives those that live with hiv the tools to live out loud with their diagnosis not be ashamed not live in stigma um but one thing we tell them is you are not your diagnosis you didn't get di- you know you didn't get your diagnosis because you was this promiscuous little girl or it was because of the system that you were brought up in. You know, you wasn't protected. You didn't have, like, you probably didn't have the education that you needed to learn about transmission. You probably didn't even have the funds to get the condoms that you might have needed. You probably didn't get the help that you needed for mental health support. Your mom probably didn't have um, access to the best doctors or, so it is it, so much, like you said, Dr. Stacy. this system that we bring our kids up in that puts them at risk. Um, it's a national organization. I think it's called Coming Threads. And in Coming Thread, the base of it is that being a black woman, being a black person, just say in Texas, we are all on this same thread line and that it could be any of us. So it's not like if you're going to get a diagnosis of HIV, it's when almost. Because it's different people from different backgrounds not the poorest, not the richest. It's kind of like maternal mortality. It has no class, gender, anything like that. It's the system that we're put in that that get us to the line of reaching our diagnosis. 
So it's not just that one thing. And so I think again, with when it comes to the hospitals, first the, the shame and the stigma that's brought in because you do have HIV, you're going to do self blaming. So you don't know how to always advocate for yourself. Not saying that the work is not being done. The work is not done being done enough for those because the numbers are still trending and going up further than where it needs to be. Um, and so I think they're not doing this because we're not doing enough advocating. We're not doing enough uh, changing. We're not doing enough fighting for the people that need that access. And so I'm going to say that's why <laughs> we have to do the work. Stacey, do you want to add on anything to that? I think Deandra said it so well. I, you know, defer to, to her expertise with that because, um, you know, I, I certainly am um, kind of, you know, just in many ways distressed by the ways that um, HIV AIDS support has um, been, you know, withheld um, in medical spaces. And one thing that came to mind just in my thinking is that with the um, Affordable Care Act, um, they have recently removed coverage for PrEP. Um, and it it's, uh, was a devastating blow to folks living with HIV AIDS because one of the biggest issues about, you know, treatment has been access. And so now, um, you know, that that protection has been removed and it opens the doors for other types of protections to be removed um, and basically gut that law um, that was designed to equalize and bring access um, for health care for all. And, and so, you know, I just think about those things and how far we have to go, how much advocating we have to do mm -hmm. um, in order to um, get these kinds of supports for people. We have a little under 10 minutes left, and I think what you're bringing up connects to a question that, that unless somebody uh, puts something else in the chat might be our, our last question of the day, but it's kind of a, it's a two parter and I think that it, it is one that is imp important. So I'm going to combine these and say. So, what are the best strategies for advocating effectively for issues? important to you um, and I guess to, to also think about like what has been most effective in your experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I can start us off and then, um, but I was, I was thinking about this question, particularly and advocacy strategies. And one of the things that I um, kind of in my own, own experience, I kind of just dove in. I don't know that I recommend that, but I didn't have a strategy. I kind of was just like, I see these things that I, I care deeply about and I want to help. But one thing I will say, even though I wasn't like overtly thinking strategically, I, I did do strategic things. Um, so one of the things that I started with, especially in kind of coming into the reproductive justice work, is I thought first about what resources I could bring to bear because I didn't want to show up into a community and say, hey, I want to help, but have no thoughts about how I can help or things I can do. And so, you know, even in my approach to um, Executive Director Jones, I was kind of giving her my profile and I said, okay, here are the things that I have as skill sets or expertise, here's how I want to come work with you all. And I also didn't do that in a way that was so, um, one of my first introductions uh, to the AFIA Center was through the summit. Um, and so I had initially kind of started making sure that I was in space, that I understood the group I wanted to, you know, work with, because you don't want to just come into a space with people that you don't really you know, know deeply, especially I'm thinking about those folks who are advocating that are coming from much different places than the people that they're supporting, because a lot of times people who are kind of um, have certain types of privilege or certain types of um, advantages, they want to help, but it's like, how do I? But then you might go into a space and, and actually like be problematic. 
Mm -hmm. because you're coming with all of your stuff and all of your pre you know conceived ideas sometimes people come i i've heard terms like pity thrown around and other things it's like oh no 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 you can't come in like that and also i think that you have to kind of examine yourself before you go into advocating for anything and ask yourself why do i want to be an advocate what do i want to accomplish do they need me because sometimes you are you are a good like your your heart is in the right place but maybe your your the things that you're bringing aren't the things they need and you need to hear from them so you know i i i started with those principles and then i looked for resources places where so i came in they didn't have to pay me i was able to come in with my own funding and i was able to work in that space so that they could get the benefit because i had a, a fellowship um, those kind of things. I, I I think about other resources. What do you have access to that you can provide? Maybe you have a skill you offer. Maybe you have, you know, something you do um, that can be supported. So those kind of things are the places where I would say start and, and having, having a sense of strategy is important. Starting with resources, building community, getting immersed in the communities you want to support. Those are, are key, are very key, so. Thank you. Deandra. Yes, uh, Dr. Stacy, I'm glad you said that because I was thinking um, about that and you did exactly what I look for, like, because I work with the organization, like I'm the community. And so when, when people come in, like, how can we help or what is the work, like what work needs to be done? I always think about like divest, divest in, bigger organizations and invest into grassroots, you know, organizations, because again, we are the ones that are doing the direct service work. Um, take risk. You have to think about the question or one of the students ask about um, just being able to like have the uh, having conversa uncomfortable conversation. I'm going to say that take a risk. Sometimes there is maybe I'm going to take it all on. Some days it may not. Some days you may come in to the field center and Dr. Stacy can attest to this and what your agenda may be, maybe what we need, but we don't know how to get there to your agenda. So she definitely took a risk. We're working with us because we've never really done a research project. And so that was a risk for her to trust us to get the work that she needed done on an academia level. Um, shifting the funding and funding the movement uh, if you truly believe in what you're doing, if you truly believe in the organization or the work or um, whatever it is, funding is always one of the best things that you can do. And you may not have the funding, but when you come across funding opportunities, um, presenting those things to the to those organizations that are doing the work and shifting some of the issues and barriers that we have, like those are the biggest things I can say. Um, with the affiliates in them before COVID, we had maybe six or seven people on our staff after COVID because of abortion work, because of COVID, we're now up to 21 people, you know? And so that was all because of funding that came in because people seeing how maternal mortality was highlighted and no one's really doing the work. People seeing how abortion access was not accessible for black people so people were able to shift the money in and so we were able to get the things some of the things that we needed but again if the money is being shifted this way you got to know that the problems are, are trending up more and so more funding and more help and more resources are always needed to continue to work in and to sustain the work that we do and you think about like we see right in the middle of the community we serve so ways to sustain that community is sustain the organization that's pouring into the community. Wonderful points. I know um, there were in the chat a few, a few thanks. Um, and most recently, Ty said that thanks for bringing this up. Stacy is a tricky space and there are some excellent questions to ask oneself. Um, and I, I think it all comes back to everything I've heard you say here in, in the lot to this last question comes back to um, kind of a two, two part, right? Self reflection and 
also reaching out to the organization or to the community and seeing what they need instead of making assumptions mm -hmm. about what they need. That's uh, you brought up at the beginning. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I want to thank you again for joining us today and for sharing your expertise and your insights and yourselves. Um, it's been a pleasure getting to meet you, although remotely. Uh, and I, I wish you best of luck in all of the amazing work that you are doing. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And I can say the emojis are way better than Zoom. I've been tickled, yeah. like tickle peek at all of the reactions. <laughs> yes, I am like, maybe I'm going to use WebEx in the future. Yeah. I love them. They, they're the best. You see all this going on over here? I'm yes. like, yes. <laughs> so whenever you see me laughing, I'm, I'm like laughing at the reaction. They're the best. I love them. <laughs> Impressive. Impressive. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. You Thanks. all too. Bye bye.